Hi learners, welcome to another mini lesson. We're still on the GI system. This time we're gonna be talking about the large intestine and elimination. So this is it, this is what you've been waiting for. This is the poop lecture. All right, so just to make sure that you understand, you are medical professionals, you work in healthcare, so you can't say poop, right? So we can say feces, we can say bowel movements, and we can say stool, but you can't document poop. So those are the terms you're working with now. So let's look at the structure of the large intestine. The large intestine is named because the diameter is large, not the length. So remember the small intestine had a small diameter, but it was really long. The large intestine has a larger diameter, but it is actually shorter. So the large intestine forms this perimeter around the abdominal cavity. Where the large intestine joins the small intestine, there is a valve called the ileocecal sphincter or the ileocecal valve. Ileocecal just means it forms a junction between the ileum and the cecum. So there is a one-way valve and it allows the chyme to pass from the small intestine into the large intestine, and it prevents the chyme to only move in one direction. So the cecum is the first section of the large intestine, and it forms sort of like a pouch in the lower right quadrant. At the end of that pouch is a small little tube, and we call that the vermiform appendix. So you've heard of your appendix, right? That's a little tube sort of thing that projects downward from the cecum. We don't really know what the purpose of the appendix is. Obviously you can live without your appendix because you've heard of people losing their appendix all the time. Um, some people argue that it's left over from evolution, but we and some people argue that it plays a role in the immune system, but we don't really know what the purpose of the appendix is. So moving on from the cecum, if you move up the right side, we have the ascending colon. That extends upward until just under the liver and then it turns, and that turn is called a flexure. So a flexure just means a bend. It turns right under the liver, so that turn is called the hepatic flexure. It turns at the hepatic flexure, sometimes we call it the colic flexure. Colic just means pertaining to the colon. So that hepatic flexure is where the colon turns, and then we call it the transverse colon. So the transverse colon goes across the upper portion of the abdomen, and then there's another turn. It makes a downward turn this time. And on the left side, we call it the left colic flexure. And this time it's near the spleen, so we sometimes call it the splenic flexure. Again, flexure just means a turn or a bend. And now it's coming down, so it's the descending colon. It's coming down the left side of the abdomen. So the descending colon is along the left side of the abdomen. And then the colon makes this kind of little S shape. That S shape is called the sigmoid colon. Then at the bottom of that sigmoid colon, the large intestine ends in the rectum and then in the anal canal. The rectum has three transverse folds or three folds that go across. Remember transverse just means to go across. And it also contains valves that enable it to hold on to the feces and allows us to pass gas. Can't say pass gas, right? Because we're medical professionals. So we use the term flatus. Can't say farts, have to say flatus or flatulence. Flatulence is mostly nitrogen and oxygen, about 90% nitrogen and oxygen together with methane, hydrogen, sulfites, carbon dioxide, and fermented bacteria from undigested food. So that's what gives it its air quotes here, characteristic Odor. So the anal canal is the last one to two inches of that large intestine and it opens to the outside as the anus. So the anus is the actual opening to the outside. Within the anus is the mucous membrane. It's folded into six to eight longitudinal, meaning up and down, longitudinal anal columns. And the pressure of the feces against those anal columns causes a secretion of mucus which provides lubrication during defecation. So you can't say pooping, you're healthcare professionals, now you can't say pooping, you have to use the term defecation. We have two sphincter muscles in the anus. We have an internal sphincter muscle and an external sphincter muscle. Remember, a sphincter is just a circular muscle that opens or closes an opening. The internal sphincter muscle is involuntary. The external sphincter muscle is voluntary. So potty training is all about getting voluntary control over that external sphincter muscle. So there you go. There's your overall structure of the large intestine. 
All right, so let's look at the function of the large intestine. The main function of the large intestine is absorption, and it's absorption of water and electrolytes. So most of our digestion has occurred in the small intestine, and absorption of water is the main function of the large intestine. So the large intestine receives more than a liter of chyme each day from the small intestine, and it reabsorbs water and electrolytes to reduce the volume of all of that chyme down to about 100 or 150 milliliters of feces that's eliminated. So we go from this really large volume down to a much more concentrated volume that gets eliminated and we need to reabsorb all that water back into our body. Another function of the large intestine is secretion of mucus that helps protect the intestinal wall and helps to hold the particles of the fecal matter together to form the feces that we eliminate. There is some digestion by bacteria in the large intestine. Like I said, not as much as that occurs in the small intestine, mostly absorption of water in the large intestine. Peristalsis, remember those are the muscular contractions that move food through the large intestine. So there is peristalsis in the large intestine, but not as much. It doesn't happen as frequently in the large intestine. There is something called the gastrocolic reflex, and this occurs when we ingest food into the stomach. The gastrocolic reflex will generate mass movement of feces from the large intestine. And then obviously elimination of materials that were not digested or absorbed. All right, so here's some words that look alike. So colon, colic, and colitis. Those all have C-O-L as their root word. So C-O-L refers to the colon. So the first one obviously is the word colon. That's the structure, the large intestine. Colic, the I-C ending means pertaining to. So if we refer to something as colic, we are referring to something pertaining to the colon. And then colitis, you should know by now, itis means inflammation of, so we're referring to some sort of inflammation of the colon. Flatus, flatulence, and flatulent refers to the gas or air expelled from the anus. So flatus, the U-S, is the noun ending, so that's the air that's expelled. Flatulence, the ends means forming, so that's the process of forming that air. And flatulent is the adjective, so you can describe somebody as being flatulent. You're like, yo, dude, that guy is very flatulent. So there you go, you just learned a new adjective. All right, so let's talk about some disorders of the large intestines. Appendicitis, you guys are probably all familiar with this term, right? Appendicitis is one of the most common causes of acute abdominal pain. The pain with appendicitis is usually associated with right lower quadrant pain. So we talked about the abdominal quadrants way back a bunch of videos ago. I think it was in chapter three, chapter two or chapter three. So right lower quadrant pain, because that's where the appendix is usually found, not in 100% of people, but usually. When you palpate or press on somebody's abdomen, they usually have tenderness over some Something called McBurney's point. And McBurney's point is about one third of the distance from the top of the anterior superior iliac crest. That's the top of the hip bone. You can uh, feel, you can palpate your own top of the hip bone there between the anterior superior iliac crest and the umbilicus or the belly button. Remember you're healthcare professionals now, so you can't say belly button. You have to say umbilicus. If you press on that point, McBurney's point, and the person has pain, that is suggestive of appendicitis. It's not 100%, but it's suggestive. Um, if an inflamed appendix is just left alone and ignored, it could rupture, it could perforate and rupture, which would lead to peritonitis, which is very severe. It's an inflammation within that peritoneal cavity. We talked about the peritoneal cavity in the last video. If the person has already had a ruptured appendix and they come in complaining of abdominal pain and they have what we call rebound tenderness, meaning you press on their abdomen very slowly and you let go suddenly and they have stabbing severe pain, that's called rebound tenderness. That suggests they already have peritonitis. There's a couple other signs that we look for too. Um, but that's a surgical emergency. In that case, we would need to go in and perform surgery to remove the ruptured appendix. So removal of an inflamed appendix or a ruptured appendix is called an appendectomy. If the appendix has not already ruptured, 
we can perform the surgery through laparoscopy, which means using a scope to look through an incision in the abdomen. Diverticulosis is the presence of something called diverticula, or little small pouches, which bulge outward through weak spots in the lining of the intestine. And you can have a couple of these, or you can have hundreds of these along the length of the large intestine. And these diverticula can be asymptomatic, and the person may not even know they're there. If they are asymptomatic, the person has diverticulosis. If they become inflamed or infected, then we say the person has diverticulitis. And diverticulitis can cause symptoms like abdominal pain, vomiting, fever, constipation. They can also lead to perforation of the large intestine, which can be very serious for the patient. And the most likely cause of diverticulosis and diverticulitis is a low fiber diet. And why is that the most likely cause? Because a low fiber diet means that the fecal material passing through the intestine doesn't move along the intestine very well. It tends to sit and become stagnant in the intestine. So eat your fiber, kids. Ulcerative colitis is the next one on the list here. This is an extensive, this is an extensive inflammation and ulceration in the lining of the large intestine. And it can be very painful and it produces bouts of bloody diarrhea, crampy abdominal pain. It can produce weight loss and electrolyte imbalances. And it's very uncomfortable for the person. Irritable bowel syndrome, we covered in a previous video. Um, it's a fairly common large bowel disorder, and it presents with crampy abdominal pain, flatulence. It can cause either constipation or diarrhea. There's no one simple diagnostic test that we can do. It's usually based on the symptoms that are reported by the patient. Polyps are masses of tissue that grow from the wall of the large intestine or any other tube-like structure in the body, and they protrude into the lumen or into the opening of the large intestine. They can vary in size and shape, and most of them are benign. We can take a biopsy of these polyps and send them for analysis to determine if they are precancerous or cancerous. And very often we'll find that they are precancerous and they need to be removed. Colon cancer and rectal cancers are the second leading cause of cancer deaths following lung cancer. Many of them occur in the distal end of the large intestine, in the, the rectum and the sigmoid colon. And these cancers can metastasize, especially to the lymph nodes, and then through the, the blood to the liver and the lung and the brain. Obstruction of the large bowel can be caused by tumors or large polyps or diverticulitis. You don't see obstruction in the large bowel as often as you see it in the small intestine, but it still can occur. And it doesn't occur in the large bowel as often because the diameter of the large bowel is larger, obviously, than the small, than the small intestine, but it still can occur. Intussusception we covered in the last video. This is when a part of the large intestine telescopes into another part of the intestine. So it does happen. And again, that's treated with a barium enema. Proctitis is inflammation of the lining of the rectum. Procto means rectum. And it can be seen with ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease or radiation therapy if the person has colon cancer or rectal cancer it can cause inflammation of the area. And symptoms include anorectal pain or rectal bleeding or excessive mucus passed in the stools. Some anal disorders, hemorrhoids are probably the most common and hemorrhoids are just varicose veins or dilated veins in the submucosal lining of the anal canal. They can be internal or external and they're associated with increased pressure. So things like pregnancy or chronic constipation or even aging can cause hemorrhoids, but um, increased pressure in the area can cause these dilated veins. And the veins can be, like I said, internal where they extend into the anal canal or external if they bulge out along the edge of the anus. A thrombosed hemorrhoid where the blood is clotted inside the, inside the vein is very, very painful. Anal fissures are tears in the lining of the anal canal, and that can occur with bowel movements that are very hard, like with constipation, chronic constipation, or if somebody is straining to have a bowel movement, 
or also with foreign bodies in the rectum, which they didn't put in your textbook, but I will tell you from working as an ER nurse can also occur. Anal fistulas, a fistula is a hole where a hole is not supposed to be. So a fistula can occur following an abscess in the, in the anal glands. So the anal canal has anal glands that secrete mucus to help lubricate the canal to pass the feces. And if those glands become infected, an abscess can form. Remember, an abscess is just a pocket of pus. And if that abscess ruptures, then a fistula or a hole can form between the anal canal and the skin outside of the anus. Okay, so here's some terminology because, you know, it's a terminology class and we can't get away from it. So um, the um ending is just a noun ending. It just means a structure or in some cases a tissue. It just means that it's a thing. It's a, it's a noun. Roid is similar to rhea. Roid means flow, like in hemorrhoid, it's an excess flow. Ion is the ending that means condition or process or action. And ative means pertaining to. So those are just some more suffixes to add to your list of many, many suffixes that you've learned along the way. Okay, so that's it for this mini lesson. The next one we will cover is the end of the chapter with procedures and pharmacology for this digestive system. Thank you as always for your attention.